Hello and welcome to my presentation on George Orwell's 1984. Today we are going to be looking at Book 3, Chapter 5. He was falling backwards into enormous depths away from the rats. He was still strapped in the chair, but he had fallen through the floor, through the walls of the building, through the earth, through the oceans, through the atmosphere, and into outer space, into the gulfs between the stars, always away, away, away from the rats. What a great scene. This is the moment that the book has been building towards, and this is the moment that we were hoping wouldn't happen, but we knew deep down that it would. And this is a very dark uh, and complex study of the human nature of what humans are prepared to do to save themselves. Okay, so before we plunge in to this chapter, let's take stock of the ideas that um, the book has been exploring. And I'd like you to really um, take note of the, the ones that stand out to you and see um, how they are being played out in this chapter and, and get a really good grasp on what you see Orwell saying about these things. So, so far, the book uh, is exploring ideas of torture. This is um, very much Winston's experience at this point in the book. Suffering is a big idea. Um, the whole book is pretty much an exploration of, of suffering to some extent. And it, can, it builds and gets worse um, in book three. And when, when we're talking about suffering, we're not just talking about physical suffering. We are also talking about um, psychological suffering, uh, emotional suffering as well. Ideas of thought control is obviously a big idea. Um, and Winston is acutely aware of um, how Big Brother and the party um, manipulate um, the populace to control them. And this leads into indoctrination. Um, many people Winston dismisses uh, because they don't uh, demonstrate any um, independent thought and um, they don't have the capacity to critique and challenge. Um, and subtly, you can see Orwell making comments about um, the masses, um, about um, the greater population and the need for people to think. Personal freedom. Um, this is something that we can see Winston craves and many people in the book crave to have that personal freedom and the real uh, cynical perspective on that that is explored in this chapter be aware of that and see um, how this idea of personal freedom becomes essentially a myth individual identity this is very much uh, something that the world of big brother seeks to destroy and this is very much something that Winston is craving and it's through lots of different acts like his diary for example where we can see that Winston is craving to carve out for himself his own identity and his own way to express himself. Truth and knowledge, a big idea. What is truth? Who has the truth? How do we get truth? How do we know what truth is? Uh, Winston, in the job that he does, he has a, a real taste for the complexity of truth and how often truth is like wrestling a greasy pig in the dark. And consciousness, being aware of who you are and what you are despite what others tell you. 
So this is Winston's life. This is very much his experience, what it means to be human in this world. And essentially, what this means is that there is no love. There is no friendship. There is no joy. There is no laughter. There is no curiosity, no courage, no integrity. So essentially, this is Winston's, li Winston's life. This is the life that uh, George Orwell is presenting to us that humans experience in this world. And as we know that the book is a warning uh, not to let uh, these totalitarian regimes take control. Um, he's saying that this is this is what will happen. Uh, these all of these aspects fr aspects friendship, love, joy, laughter. These are um, some of the major aspects that makes us human. And so here we have this warning of this: when you want to take someone's humanity away from them, you take away their friendships, their relationships. You take away their sense of love and joy. You take away their capacity to connect. You take away their integrity and their courage. And this is exactly what we see in chapter five. Winston is stripped of all of these things. And that is how O'Brien is able to control Winston and have complete power over him to get him to do exactly what he wants him to do. So let's have a look at book three, chapter five. So if you haven't already got that out in front of you, um, get the book, get a pen and a highlighter, and we're going to go through this chapter. Okay, so in this chapter, we are introduced to room 101. This room contains a person's greatest fear um, but it also contains an even more horrible lesson for Winston. So think about that lesson. What do you think O'Brien is really teaching Winston here? At each stage of his imprisonment, he had known, or seemed to know, whereabouts he was in the windowless building. Possibly there were slight differences in the air pressure. The cells where the guards had beaten him were below ground level. The room where he had been interrogated by O'Brien was high up near the roof. This place was many metres underground, as deep down as it was impossible to go. Okay, so interesting atmosphere that um, Orwell is creating here. We have this idea of um, knowledge and truth or not knowing exactly being demonstrated to, to us through the fact that Winston is, uh, I guess, guessing and he's only sort of has some idea of how things are. So in order to really um, reduce a person's um, their own sense of self and their own sense of um, power and control you need to reduce and limit what they know and and so here we have a, a great little introduction to knowledge and truth he's already vulnerable because he doesn't know where he is and if he doesn't know where he is other people certainly don't know where he is and many people probably don't even care. The cells where the guards had beaten him. So here we, we are uh, introduced to the violence that's occurring. Uh, the way he, and then he'd been interrogated. Okay, it's all very matter of fact, isn't it? Um, this place, however, okay, and that word this okay, is um, indicating a difference. This place was many metres underground. 
as deep down as it was, in, was possible to go. Okay, see that comparison there. Um, as far down underground as you could possibly go. Um, so we have this, um, this hyperbole here. Again, this links into giving this sense of Winston being completely vulnerable and powerless. It was bigger than most of the cells he had been in, but he hardly noticed his surroundings. Notice too the, the um, syntax, um, these shorter sentences. Um, often in, in the previous parts of the book, Orwell has longer and more complex sentences, but there are a lot more simple sentences here. Because notice here where you've got the but, he could have made that into one sentence, but he he's uh, shortening his sentences. And notice how that has an impact on the, the rhythm um, and even how much it's reflecting um, Winston's own mental capacity. All he noticed was that there were two small tables straight in front of him each covered with green bays. One was only a metre or two from him, the other was further away, near the door. He was strapped upright in a chair, so tightly that he could have nothing, he could move nothing, not even his head. A sort of pad gripped his head from behind, forcing him to look straight in front of him. Okay, so this section, he was strapped upright in a chair so tight that he could move nothing, not even his head. Here we are given uh, ideas about his further vulnerability, uh, this, uh, these ideas of restriction and control physically at this point through words like strapped, um, tightly, that adverb, he could move nothing, not even his head, um, gripped, forcing. So these are all very um, physical and uh, very um, violent and um, aggressive verbs and adverbs and participles. And so that idea here, forcing him to look straight in front of him, for, for us, that should make us feel a little uncomfortable and it, and it is hinting at something to come. We get this uneasy feeling that something is about to happen. It is foreshadowing um, that uh, Winston's, you know, he feels, it's like, well, you, you know, you, feel, you think that your life's pretty bad as it is, it's going to get worse. And so we have that sense of dread. For a moment he was alone, then the door opened and O'Brien came in. You asked me once, said O'Brien, what was in room 101. I told you that you knew the answer already. Everyone knows it. The thing that is in room 101 is the worst thing in the world. Okay, another aspect of foreshadowing here and through the superlatives, the worst thing in the world heightens that dread and that fear. The door opened again. A guard came in, carrying something made of wire, a box or basket of some kind. He set it down on the further table because of the position in which O'Brien was standing. Winston could not see what the thing was. So, we have this great little scene unfolding where we're getting little drips of information. It is very much this um, slow reveal where, where gradually, cause, because remember it's from Winston's perspective and he's strapped in the chair, uh, he can't move his head. And so not knowing is the very way 
that you can control someone and induce uh, incredible fear in them because they don't have control and they are completely vulnerable. And so, he, so Winston uh, is is um, completely at the mercy of the guards and O'Brien. Um, and despite all of that, and despite Winston's intelligence, keep note of how he keeps responding to O'Brien. And O'Brien repeats, the worst thing in the world, said O'Brien, varies from individual to individual. It may be burial alive or death by fire or by drowning or by impalement or 50 other deaths. There are cases where it is some quite trivial thing, not even fatal. He had moved a little to one side so that Winston had a better view of the thing on the table. It was an oblong wire cage with a handle on top for carrying it by. Fixed to the front of it was something that looked like a fencing mask. With the concave side outwards, Although it was three or four metres away from him, he could see that the cage was divided lengthways into two compartments and that there was some kind of creature in each. They were rats. Okay, great writing here. You know that last sentence there, that use of syntax is very deliberate. You've got an incredibly short and simple sentence to create that pause and that emphasis where you've got the moment building, 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 and then dun dun, then you get that moment. They were rats. Notice how um, it's always referred to as the thing on the table. And then at this point, we get these descriptions, oblong wire cage, uh, there was something that looked like a fencing mask. So we, he's not quite sure. We have that simile to give us a, that description. So we have some idea of what to imagine. But again, Winston's not sure. Although it was three or four meters away from him, he could see that the cage was divided lengthways into two compartments, some kind of creature. So all of that, the vagueness and that sense of mystery, all of that mystery creates suspension and tension. And because it's from Winston's perspective, we as the reader uh, only know something and when Winston knows it. And obviously we can read into things and know a little bit more, but we are in a, in a sense are on the journey with Winston. So here we are introduced to the rat cage. In your case, said O'Brien, the worst thing in the world happens to be rats. And see how here we're going to get this great description of fear, how Orwell captures that fear inside Winston, a sort of premonitory tremor, a fear of he was not certain what had passed through Winston as soon as he caught his first glimpse of the cage. But at this moment, the meaning of the mask-like attachment in front of it suddenly sank into him. His bowels seemed to turn to water. Notice how all of that description is tactile. How he is conveying to us Winston's fear is through that bodily experience. There is a, sorry, that is meant to say tactile. That is terrible. Let me try again. Here, it is a physical experience and Orwell is conveying to us that physical experience through demonstrating, um, through using that tactile imagery, that physical bodily imagery for us. His bowels seemed to turn to water. You can't do that, he cried out in a high cracked voice. So here we can then still get that sense of fear in Winston. 
you couldn't, you couldn't, it's impossible. See, the exclamations, that those short phrases, again, demonstrate for us Winston's psychological state here. So he is faced with his biggest fear. I wonder what your biggest fear is and whether you would respond in a similar way. It's interesting that when you are afraid, it completely takes over your brain. Um, and because of that fear, people become really angry, they become irritable, they become irrational. You have that fight or flight response. Um, so your, I guess what, for want of a better word, the caveman part of your brain takes over and you don't have that rational, um, logical thinking processes happening. And this is what we're seeing with Winston. Do you remember, and notice I want you to see also the contrast between how Winston is talking and how O'Brien is talking. So you can see how controlled O'Brien is, how measured, how calm and peaceful, almost, um, there's a subtle sort of, is he, re is he enjoying this? Um, but it's also, he continues to adopt that uh, authoritative teacher um, role where he is teaching a naughty child how to change, and how to reform. So he's going to be patient, but he's going to be stern. He's going to have power and control. That's how he will shape and nourish his student. Not a bad technique. Do you remember, said O'Brien, the moment of panic that used to occur in your dreams? Okay, that's a really odd thing to say and it's very familiar and it's very personal and it makes us wonder um, how much O'Brien really does know. And we, we get a sense that he really knows quite a lot about Winston, more than Winston could have possibly imagined because he thought in a real naive sense that if you wrote it down, then there's a chance that people would know. But if you kept it in your head, then nobody would know. It's yours, it's your secret. And, and that touches on those ideas of what you have inside your head is your own, that's private. It's, it's what you can take hold and have for yourself. And so that is what he clung to, is that at least at the, the party are not going to get inside my head. At least they don't know what's inside there and that is my own. And now not only are we ex being witness, not only are we witnessing this torture that's about to, you know, that's happening to Winston, but we are also seeing that it's not just how the physical control they have, but they can control his mind because they know what is going on inside. And so we have this double tragedy in a sense where we, Winston slowly comes to realize that so much of what he thought he was able to have to himself and to control and have that independent thought and that consciousness and have at least that freedom or thought inside his own mind it's it's it's, it's a complete uh, illusion and that they they knew exactly what he was thinking and feeling and so that is quite devastating for winston there was a wall of blackness in front of you and a roaring sound in your ears. So these details are meant to demonstrate how much O'Brien knows and it creates that sense of intimacy that O'Brien is, is seeking to um, have between himself and Winston. Even just in this description, you've got this lovely uh, writing of blackness and roaring sound in your ears. <laughs> 